Moin Moin und hello ladies and gentlemen und Spector here today, finally with an other deck amp review and I have for you the uh, long over the review for the Ada Power Deck 2.1. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure why uh, this one slipped through like I bought it I think like a year ago or so and I've been using it since then like yeah off and on and yeah today I'm finally taking a look what the power deck power actually can do and what it can't. And as usual with all of my reviews we start with a quick uh, yeah, packaging and accessories. That's the packaging. As you can see it's not much bigger than the actual device and then you would open it with just a tiny bit of art bin, uh, around it and then here would be the device in and the only accessories you get is this um, let's say rather functional cable but you also get this uh, balance 2.5 to a not balance 3.5 adapter which is a nice touch because uh, yes this thing only has a balance 2.5 output so that's that this definitely makes it much more usable uh, more on that later on and that's basically it you don't get anything else. Although for the price of like 90 bucks or 80 bucks, depending on where or when you buy it, is actually pretty good. And then next, let's talk about connectivity and power. Uh, today actually we'll start with power, not connectivity. And this small box here actually is a pretty good powerhouse. It's rated at 600 milliwatts in balanced or 600 milliwatts in unbalanced boost mod, which is Definitely very good as uh, you will probably know if you have seen any other dongles Let me just get the FC4 in here. You can see it's like It's definitely like half the size you could say of the power deck But this one is rated I think what was it like 290 milliwatts or something like that So this one here coming in with double that is definitely nice to have and uh, Yeah, that is making it rather unique with a yeah, device of this size um, Yeah, but uh, uh, more than that, uh, yeah, with great power comes great responsibility and unfortunately uh, the bad news now comes with connectivity. Mm, USB B, uh, what? Like I haven't seen USB B in, I don't know, like a decade or so, maybe on a printer. But yeah, this is why you get this weird chunky cable here that looks like it's straight from a printer. Um, yeah, it's used via USB B. And I have to say, I hate that, like, this is the worst implementation of any USB I have seen because it's so outdated. I know it probably has to do something with the kind of connector or bridges they use, I have no clue. Like, they probably describe it somewhere, but still, like, please, USB-C, it's 2023 now. Uh, I bought this in 2022, but even then it was outdated. Even in 2018 it would have been outdated, or 2015 for that matter. USB-C, nothing else, please. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, connectivity-wise, this thing has Bluetooth, but big asterisk, you can only use Bluetooth to connect it with the app. You cannot uh, splice in music via Bluetooth. So uh, I don't know how I feel about that, I have to be honest. Uh, because if you already go out of your way and put a Bluetooth chip in, why not put a tiny bit better Bluetooth chip in that actually allows to also splice in music via Bluetooth? Wouldn't cost you much more, probably has similar like uh, capability somewhere else, but uh, would make this thing uh, just a bit better usable overall. Okay, which then also brings me to the chapter usability. And uh, I think today we be starting off with yeah, the uh, USB problem here. Because this cable included here does not make this usable via smartphone. If you want to use it via smartphone, you have to do, let me show you how I tried it. You have to do this motion. So you use an USB A to C uh, adapter and then you could use it on a smartphone. Or because most laptops today usually are a bit mm, scarce when it comes about I.O. This is also what I had to do if I want to use it on my work laptop because my work laptop only has two USB A's and those are used for a keyboard and for my mouse. So yeah, this was the only solution I had there. And I have to tell you, it was a few times when I took it to work, I actually, actually forgot this adapter. And then I kind of didn't use it at work because like, I just like, ugh, ugh, ugh. and then yeah, worse of all, if you forget this adapter, you can't even use it at all because who in the world's like, who has a cable like that lying around at work still like just doesn't exist. And it actually is a bit annoying. Um, next big annoying part I have to talk about when we talk about power deck. 
Um, yeah, I, I don't know what chips we're using in here, but this gets hot. I tell you, hot. Like really, this is, if you leave it at like 30 degrees that we have at the moment here in Germany, if you leave it out like that and you use whatever you want on it, it's getting so hot. I don't want to touch it. Like it's really in levels of heat where I'm, you will not get burned, but it's very uncomfortable. And I usually just very quickly touch it, move it to somewhere and then leave it again because it's really uncomfortable. Unfortunately, I do not have a FLIR camera, so I can't tell you how hot exactly it is. But I would say it easily reaches 50 degrees Celsius and that is really not nice. And they should definitely fix that in the next iteration. Use more heatsink, use like something like other chips, like it just gets too hot. And that makes it really uncomfortable to use. Uh, time wise ball, uh, because you can see it already. Let me get it to the camera so you can hear. That is already thick metal. Uh, but the main problem is the surface area is not big enough. so. Once this uh, heatsink basically soaks full, which happens after like 30 minutes or so, yeah, like it's not going to help much. It's just going to keep increasing in heat and heat until it reaches like something after 50 degrees and then doesn't get hotter than that. So I have not seen this thing smoking or anything, right? But it gets really hot and I would not recommend it if you plan to use it somewhere where possibly flammable materials are around, like this here is cardboard. Would not put it on cardboard, I have to say. Uh, risk is just too high of it doing something. Um, yeah, and on that, I think that's pretty much it about usability. Like, is a big box, like you could use this on a smartphone. Would not recommend to do so because it uh, draws a lot of power when we still talk about usability here. Uh, like really draws a lot of power. So if you put it at your smartphone, it will drain the battery very quickly, but you could. And yeah, you just then again need this adapter in order to plug it in at all. Okay, um, oh, uh, next, uh, last part about usability. Um, yeah, so a standard mod, this comes in balanced mod, or uh, I think. So this means uh, you can only use it as is, like here. If you want to use a non-balanced uh, headphone or IEM, you need to use this adapter here, which is from 2.5 balanced to 3.5 not balanced. And yeah, this is not possible with all uh, amplifiers, remind you. So please don't use this on other devices. It could kill your device. Just use this on the device that it's meant to be used for. And this is this one here. Because if you set this to unbalanced mode, it will do some jiggly in whatever internals and then it will not short. That's uh, yeah, a long story short here. But this uh, generally makes it easier to use because you can plug in when any other headphone or IM you want. Uh, more about that later on though. Uh, so yes, nice of them to add it here and actually I'm fine with the only 2.5 millimeter outlet. Yeah, that's totally okay. Next, let's talk about the software. And uh, I think this is actually a strong point of the PowerDAC 2.1, I have to say. Uh, the software they have here uh, is pretty usable. It has filters and whatever. I took a few notes here. Um, you can set loudness, you can set treble, you can set bass. You can activate a compressor, you can create a customized filter, which basically is an equalizer. And the nicest thing about all of this is it's saved on the device here. So you can just save it here uh, with a preset and then you can load it on for whenever you want, just quickly pair it with Bluetooth. And yeah, you can use it then for whatever. Like uh, I used it for instance to fix my Elysia. Uh, again, Elysia is a bit, bit weird in tonality, but you can easily fix that with EQ. I uh, did that. Also try to fix my DIY headphone, for which I find you'll be making a review, I think, next week or so. And yeah, this generally works pretty well and I like this feature a lot. Uh, adding to this niceness here is you can actually also uh, load uh, presets of other people in here. It supports that and you can find uh, all sorts of profiles here, like in quotes, neutralization profiles that kind of fix not so neutral headphones. Uh, but you can also find them for like a uh, Harman approximations for instance, HD 6XX or even the LCD 4 for that matter. So uh, this definitely is nice and I uh, like to see this feature in more devices. Just give me a customizable EQ to save on this device. Very much like this feature. <laughs> it's basically also the reason why I bought it in the first place. Um, Although I have to say there are a few asterisks here. Uh, first one being, um, yeah, like the app is not in full parametric EQ, right? Uh, if you have used, for instance, Equalizer APO with piece as a, a GUI, uh, not that. Like you can only set the Q value here and the decibels, so nothing else. You can set any other filters. 
but uh, because you can set, I think, an arbitrary amount of uh, filters in their uh, app here, um, you can basically fix anything you want. It's just a bit more work than uh, just setting in slope and uh, run rise and gain whatever with the equalize IPO. It's just a bit more work here. And I think they would benefit from adding a real parametric EQ here. Um, on that note, uh, I have heard the Quidlex 5K uh, has best software here with real parametric EQ. Uh, uh, Ada, look at their software and maybe do that. Uh, but I personally have not used the Quidlex, just have heard people praising it and saying, yeah, this is best software you can have for like Bluetooth or even on Bluetooth devices. Um, other than that, um, yeah, there's a few, uh, let's say, uh, quirks with the software. Uh, it's a bit buggy occasionally, like, uh, let me go to my notes here. Da, 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 da. Oh yeah, I have to note two examples. Um, theoretically, you can move uh, the points where you set the EQ filter. Uh, you just select it and then you can move it to somewhere. Uh, you can select multiple here, but you can't move multiple. Like, I'm pretty sure this is supposed to work because if you press on them longer, you can select them, but you can't move when multiple at the same time. It's a bit strange. I think that's in bug, but it's not annoying. <laughs> Unlike the next bug, if you go to the, uh, uh, the EQ page, basically, that we call filter, I think here, um, you can sometimes run into a situation where the app suddenly gets stuck in the horizontal layout, which then cuts off important menu functions in the main menu. And uh, the only way to fix this is either restart the app or you in the EQ menu, you find yourself in a menu that is not horizontal, then go back and then hope it suddenly realizes it is no longer horizontal again. That's pretty annoying, uh, as happened to me a few times when I used it. And uh, yeah, I hope we fix that because that's really annoying. Um, the next criticism I have of software is um, why on Earth's name do you need location to activate Bluetooth? You don't need that. I criticized this with a few other Bluetooth devices already. If you just want to have a Bluetooth connection with a device, your phone does, or the, your device does not need location data. It just does not. And uh, here, unfortunately, it is not usable without location. It straight up does not want to pair. And I'm absolutely sure this is an error on their end, on error, like it's intended, like they're most likely also collecting some kind of data. Uh, but I really hope they fix that. This again is one of those things where you don't get any benefits from them collecting location data here and it's just not needed and uh, just, just just throw it away, like uh, not needed at all. And then uh, next, let's talk about sound. Um, yeah, so how does the PowerDAX sound? Uh, obviously, <laughs> assuming we don't set any modifications in the app here, which uh, for this part here, I will assume we did not. Um, I think it's rather neutral, like maybe a tad warmer, uh, definitely a bit more softer than the standard DS9218 uh, dongles. Uh, for instance, again, the FC4 has that and uh, the BTR5 and VAP5 and most other devices use that. Uh, it's just a tad softer to my ear, a bit tiny, tiny, tiny tad warmer maybe, I would do almost quite a bit of software. Uh, but I would not agree with some other people that I have said, like, uh, it could sounding even a bit like tube-like. I don't agree with that. Uh, it's, it's just a bit softer, that's all. Uh, Detail-wise, though, well, I think it's almost all here. Um, I don't think you miss anything, um, especially in comparison to instance of BDR5. But somehow I still have the feeling the UP5 sounds a bit more, uh, more transparent, a bit more detailed overall. But it's really not a lot. And I would say, yeah, this is fine. Uh, in every regard there. However, there's a big asterisk here when we talk about sound, um, noise flow. This thing is not usable for IEMs, you can't use it at all. 32 ohm single DD IEM has noise floor and everything beneath that has a very noticeable noise floor and I would not recommend the power DAC uh, for anybody who's planning to use IEMs. The noise floor is just too high. However, even low impedance over ear headphones do not have that problem. And uh, I think the 16 ohm Elysia, is it 16 ohm? I forgot. Uh, no noise floor at all, like that silent. Uh, but yeah, IEMs don't work with this. And this is true for the balanced and the non balanced. Both have noise level. And I cannot recommend the power DAC for that. And that brings me to the conclusion. Um, yeah, it's $80 to $90. It has a lot of power and it has cool software features. 
and I would like to recommend it because I like this idea of saving your profile here a lot. I just can't. It's not utilitarian enough, the noise floor is just too high, it's getting too hot and when still adding the location data on top, um, no sorry, like it's, it's good and I think in the next iteration if they fix the noise floor and remove uh, the heat problem, hopefully also location, but let's just say they keep the same app and they don't do that, then I would probably recommend it. But as it stands now with the noise floor here, I just can't recommend it. Uh, it's just not good enough uh, for most of my headphones. Um, I think for instance, the FC4 here, uh, while being smaller, uh, consuming less energy and having uh, 3.5 non-balanced and 4.4 balanced, does a very similar job, if not better, and it's smaller, and you just less, uh, the like half power that this has. I don't know, do you really need 600 milliwatts with most headphones? I don't think so. And if you need more power, why not go for something even more powerful than like, uh, there's no real reason for me for this to exist as it is now. And that's why I will not recommend it. But I would say if they fix the issue with the noise floor and the heat, I think this can be recommended. It's a pretty cool device and the app, uh, how it is now, is already good. If you add full parametric EQ, be really good. And saving it on this thing is so nice. Like just take it wherever you want and quickly connect it, uh, fix the sound to or whatever other device you want to plug in. That's a nice feature and I like it very much. And yeah, that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions, if you have other recommendations for amplifiers or for headphones or for IEMs for that matter, leave a comment. And with the Stone Spector, out.